Hello and welcome to the integumentary system uh, lecture. We're going to go ahead and get started. I don't have a question for this one, but we're just going to get under your skin a little bit today. So the integumentary system, what I want you to know, a few basic facts is that uh, this is going to include your skin and the accessory organs to your skin. And just interesting enough, uh, this is going to make up about 16% of your total body weight. The purpose is to protect your body from pathogens, so that could be bacteria or uh, viruses, parasites, various other small microorganisms, chemicals, and UV light, so light from the sun. It's going to prevent water loss and regulate your temperature. It's going to do this via sweating as well as acting as insulation. It is going to promote vitamin D synthesis, and you're going to get this from your exposure to the sun, as well as act as lipid storage. Remember when we talk about lipids, we're talking about fat, and it is made up of two layers, although it's technically three. So these first two layers that we're going to talk about is the epidermis, epi meaning above, and then the dermis, which is going to just be this layer that is below the epidermis. So the epidermis is made of stratified squamous epithelial cells. We've talked about this before. There is no blood supply. And the example I can give to you of how you can sort of know this is, did you ever or did you know someone potentially in a younger grade, maybe they still do it, maybe they don't, uh, but they would take like a little pin or something, like a little safety pin, and stick it just underneath that top layer of skin and then turn their finger upside down, or maybe it was their palm, but chances are it was one of their fingers. Uh, so that little layer that they're sticking that pin under and then they pull it out and it wouldn't bleed is just that epidermis. So again, there's no blood supply going deeper than the epidermis. You're going to hit the dermis, which does have blood supply. There's two very important factors that we're going to find in the epidermis, and that is keratin. This is one of the most important things I want you to get from this section, is that we have keratin. This is a waterproof protein, so it is going to waterproof that epidermis. And then we have something called melanocytes. Melanocytes, uh, which again we're seeing this term, sites, just means cells, remember? but is going to have something to do with melanin. Uh, melanin is the pigment protein uh, that is in your skin. It is going to give your hair its color, your eyes their color, as well as your skin its color as well. But melanocytes are specifically these uh, pigment protein producing cells. Try saying that five times fast. Next, we have the dermis, which is going to be made up of dense fibrous connective tissue. It's going to be very collagen rich. So again, if we did that little uh, bit where we lift up our skin and then drop it, it goes back in place. It's because of that collagen. Uh, this is also going to contain, very important, all of the accessory structures that go along with skin. So make sure you know that. All the accessory structures are going to be located in the dermis, not the epidermis. Now over here on this picture, everything above the line that I'm drawing is the epidermis. Everything below it is the dermis. So I do want you to know a couple structures for the anatomy of your skin. Um, we are going to go over a few of these kind of individually, uh, but let me point some of these out here while we can kind of work around uh, this, this illustration. I do want you to know the hair shaft. That is going to be the external part of the hair, so it's the part of the hair that you can see. Um, so everything above the surface of the skin. I do want you to know what these little nerve endings look like, and it's just these little structures down here. You can also see one over here. Maybe I need a different color. Over here and over here. 
I do want you to know a sebaceous gland. You can tell a sebaceous gland because it's going to surround a hair just like this. It's going to look like a cluster of grapes. It is going to produce oil or sebum, and we will talk about that later. Um, I want you to know the erector pili muscle. Uh, that is this structure right here that's attached to the hair follicle. And then the hair follicle is just this structure that's wrapping around the bulb or root of the hair, which I do want you to know both of these terms. There is a blood supply that we can see right here to uh, that follicle. So that is what's going to be stimulating the growth of your hair. Uh, if you pull out a hair and you pull out the follicle and you notice a little bit of blood, uh, you've just disrupted the, the blood supply. And if you rip out the follicle, uh, that will stop that hair from ever growing again. I do want you to know uh, these Meisner corpuscles versus a Pacinian corpuscle. Meisner corpuscles are going to be closer to the surface they're going to be more superficial. As Pacinian corpuscles are going to be deep. So Meissner corpuscles are going to detect a light touch. So very, very light touch. So even if uh, your eyes were closed and I just barely ran my hand over the top of your uh, your skin, wherever, uh, you're going to be able to feel it because of one, hairs, as well as these Meissner corpuscles. Now, the Pacinian corpuscles are going to detect pressure, deep pressure. So if I push, and you can tell how hard I push, that is the, the Pacinian corpuscles that are telling you that. You can also find the Pacinian corpuscles in your stomach, your bladder, um, probably within the GI tract, but they detect pressure. So a good example of these guys is when you're really full, uh, they detect that pressure that is stretching and expanding your stomach. So kind of cool. Good to note that this is a pore, these little holes right here, which are going to lead to this structure down here, which is going to be a sweat gland. And we'll talk about uh, the various types of sweat glands, but this one is specifically an eccrine sweat gland, which is going to produce more so water uh, in your sweat as opposed to other sweat glands, which we will talk about. This is that third uh, layer I was alluding to. It is the hypodermis. It's going to be made up of mostly fat and blood vessels. Just know that this is the dermis. There are two layers to the dermis. I'm not going to ask you about them. And then the epidermis is made up of five layers, which we are going to talk about each one of these. So make sure you know them, but there is a better slide showing that. So some of these accessory structures, again, remember that all of these are going to be part of the dermis. Now you might be saying, but Rachel, I can see that there's a hair coming out right here out of the epidermis. You are correct. But the part that we're going to be focusing on that is where all the parts of the hair is, is going to be below the epidermis. It's just passing through the epidermis. So nails and hair are going to be made up of keratin. Remember that is that waterproof protein. Part of the hair is going to be a muscle or attached to the hair is a muscle. That is the erector pili muscle. I do want you to know that the erector pili muscle is going to produce goosebumps. It makes your hair stand erect. You have those sensory receptors that we uh, talked about. So the corpuscles as well as your nerve endings. Sebaceous glands, again, are those structures that are going to surround a hair follicle, usually looking like a cluster of grapes. And they produce oil or sebum. So when your hair 
mostly up at the top, starts feeling kind of greasy. It can also look greasy. Your hair will fall more flat, closer to your head. That is due to an excess of sebum. The purpose of sebum is to protect your hair, um, which it does, but in excess, it can kind of make it look a little gross, can also make it smell a little bit gross. But that's also because there's bacteria and other organisms that are going to eat that sebum, which they can also cause a smell as well. There are sweat glands as well. Uh, they usually look kind of like a ball of spaghetti noodles to me, but they are mostly going to just go up to the surface of the skin. There is one type of sweat gland that we're going to talk about that's going to release into the hair follicle, but it doesn't surround the hair follicle. So it would kind of be like this ball of spaghetti and then a little uh, tube leading over to the follicle itself. Meanwhile, the sebaceous gland is going to surround that hair. So with these sweat glands, usually again, they lead up to the surface and what they're gonna secrete is usually mostly water, uh, sometimes mixed with urea, fats, and salts. We'll talk about them a little bit more later. So these epidermal layers uh, that I said that we would talk about, I do want you to know all five in order. So the stratum basal, um, it is the base layer. That is what it means, stratum, means layer and then it's going to give you a little like a uh, layer of whatever it is so this is the base layer it is a singular layer and you'll notice that it's down here so we've got our stratum basal is what we're talking about and it is this base layer right here and i'll try to color coordinate as best i can but it is a single layer of cells that is going to kind of create this little roller coaster coming down and making that bottom layer. So the way your epidermis works, and I like to think of it kind of like one of those um, popsicles, the push pops. So you push the popsicle up through that little cup that surrounds it so that you can eat just the top layer one at a time, right? So uh, that is exactly how the epidermis works. From the base layer, it pushes up uh, the cell layers, okay? So this is where mitosis is going to occur. Uh, you do have Merkel cells here. You can kind of ignore that, but they are for touch. You're also gonna find melanocytes here. And remember, melanocytes are going to produce melanin. The next layer is going to be the stratum spinosum. And we'll do this one in red. And this just means spiny layer. And this is gonna be between eight and 10 layers of cells. So we have our stratum spinosum, and it's going to include everything from the blue up. And I'm actually gonna try to weasel my way down here, back up, here we go. So from here to here, and it can kind of vary in certain spots as well as we go along this kind of like little roller coaster. And that is our stratum spinosum. It's gonna be, be uh, rich in RNA. Uh, and this is going to initiate protein synthesis, which is required uh, for protein, um, that protein keratin. We're also gonna have Langerhing cells. Again, you don't need to know that, kind of ignore that. Next, we're going to have the stratum granulosum. And this just means the grainy layer. It's gonna be somewhere around three to five uh, layers of cells. And you can always tell what it looks like because it's usually darker. Uh, it's a layer of keratinocytes, so keratin producing cells. Uh, there's no dividing and we're producing a large amount of keratin in this layer. Next, we have the stratum lucidium. And this just means clear layer. So this guy right here. These are going to be flattened, dead, keratinized cells, and they are dehydrating cells. So it's gonna be this little layer right here. Okay. And then last, but certainly not least, we have the stratum corneum. And this is going to be uh, this, this really 
interesting layer. Sometimes it's a little bit on the gross side, but if you take your arm and kind of scratch it up a little bit and then blow, and you see the little flakes fly off, that is your stratum corneum. It's also what is that layer in uh, ladies, if you know, men, if you do, that's fine too, uh, derma planning, when they take that little scalpel and they scrape away that top layer of skin. If you use an exfoliating scrub, uh, it's to get the stratum corneum off. It's that dead layer of cells, which I don't know why I use quotations, they are dead, but it is that top layer of cells that's both uh, thick, uh, part of thick and thin skin. Uh, it can be made up of 15 to 30 layers of keratinized, keratinized cells, excuse me, uh, and it's uh, going to be that layer that flakes off. So we are pushing our cells up from the stratum base cell. They are moving up through the layers. So eventually, let's just pick out this one cell right here. Eventually, he's going to move into the stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidium, and up to the stratum corneum, and then he's going to flake off and kind of go about his business being dust or whatever it may be in the air. So eventually, you will slough off uh, the stratum corneum. Uh, what's interesting down here at the bottom is it takes seven to, seven to ten days for cells to move from the stratum base cell to the stratum corneum, an additional two weeks for the stratum corneum to be sloughed off, washed off, or rubbed off. This can be with your, your uh, clothing, usually is what is going to slough off that skin. Kind of interesting. All right. So kind of cool, uh, we have thin versus thick skin. You might be wondering, well, what's the difference? Where would I find a difference? Uh, thick skin is going to be on your hands, the palms of your hands, so your fingers and your palm, as well as your toes and the soles of your feet, as well as your heels. Um, thin skin is going to be kind of everywhere else, and you can have more thin skin, like thinner skin, uh, like around your eyes, as well as uh, uh, your scalp, uh, various other places, but those are the main places. So thin skin is going to cover most of your body. Thick skin is just going to be your uh, hands and your feet, but just the palms and the soles of your feet, the bottom. I do want to talk about the three types of burns. Um, the first and second degree burns are going to be partial thickness burns. The first degree burn is going to be uh, affecting the epidermis. Uh, this is just going to be red, painful, you might have an edema. A second degree burn is going to affect the epidermis and part of the dermis, you can get blisters but the epidermis usually can regenerate from hair follicles and sweat glands. Um, a full thickness burn is going to include third degree burns. This is where the epidermis, the dermis, and potentially deeper is destroyed. This will uh, potentially require skin grafts uh, and you will have scarring. You can still have scarring in second degree burns, um, but third degree burns, you're definitely gonna have some scarring. Okay, so moving on to hair, um, more specifically just on hair, it will grow one half inch per month on average. Some people can grow their hair uh, really quickly. I had a friend in high school who she would chop her hair off to like a pixie cut and by, I don't know, maybe two or three months it would be down to her shoulders or mid back. For me, I cut my hair when I was 12 all the way up here, and it took until I was probably closer to 16 to get my hair down to my mid-back again. Curly or straight is the result of the follicle angle, so that structure that's going to surround the hair while it's in the dermis, it has a certain angle to the opening of it where that hair is coming out of. Um, so that is going to affect whether or not you have straight hair, wavy hair, curly hair, whatever uh, type of kind of textured hair as well. And then gray hair is just going to be a loss of pigment, uh, that melanin that is going to make the color of your hair. 
And then just kind of interesting, this little chart down here, there are different types of melanin, which means there's different types of pigments. So um, for black hair, you're going to have a large amount of something called eumelanin. Uh, this is going to be that darker brown uh, type color, darker brown to black color. For brown hair, you're going to have a moderate amount of eumelanin, so it's going to be a little bit lighter. Blonde hair uh, is going to have very little eumelanin, and red hair is going to have something called pheomelanin, uh, which is going to be kind of a yellow, orangey type color uh, with a little bit of eumelanin in it. So something I want to point out here, because I will point it out again when we talk about skin color, is that uh, instead of having a different pigment for dark to lighter, skin colors or hair colors, even eye colors, it's all about more or less melanin, okay? So make sure you kind of understand that. It's not that my skin is a different color than someone else's, like it's a different melanin, it's just I have less melanin in my skin that makes me have a lighter complexion than say, um, someone who has darker skin, they just have more melanin than I do. I hope that makes sense. So the anatomy of the hair, uh, we have the shaft, which is going to be the visible portion above the skin. So that's above the uh, epidermis. So it's the part that you can see. The root is going to be deep to the shaft and it is going to be uh, penetrating the dermis. So it is everything that is below the surface. And then again, just make sure you know the erector pili muscle and that it causes goosebumps. The follicle is that structure that surrounds the hair. It's going to be what nourishes the hair as well. The bulb is going to be the base of the follicle. It's going to be vascular, so that means it has a blood supply. Uh, it has a little papilla, uh, so that's that little structure down here that concaves in, and then we've got that lovely blood supply there, and that is where we're going to get our nutrients that is going to cause the growth of the hair. What's kind of interesting from this picture that you can see is that the hair grows out from the center, and it has layers, um, not dissimilar to an onion. I always find this slide kind of funny to look at, but it's honestly quite interesting. So if you've ever thought about the different kinds of hair that cover your body, if you grow body hair, some people don't, and that's okay. Uh, but for men or people who produce a little bit more testosterone or have testosterone induced, um, they will grow a different kind of hair on their face as opposed to say their arm, uh, which is kind of interesting. And that's a difference between androgenic and vellus hair. Androgenic hair is going to be coarse. Vellus hair is soft. So for females, typically most of their body is going to be covered in vellus hair. Uh, so if you want an example, you can look at your arm and feel how soft the hair is there. Um, if you want an example of androgenic hair, you can think of the pubic region, or if you have someone who has more testosterone near you, uh, go check out their face, potentially, potentially their chest or their tummy, as well as their groin region. Um, but yeah, so females and males are going to produce different kinds of hair in different places. And what's interesting is this is all a matter of sexual selection uh, and kind of just what has been more attractive to females because uh, they are the ones who kind of pick what their partners end up looking like. So if you want to think of it, kind of think like peacocks. Female peacocks, which are known as peahens, uh, have sexually selected males with those big, beautiful tail feathers, that big display. Um, so it was just a sexual selection. It's what the females preferred. So the way that men grow their hair uh, on their face, on their chest, on their tummies, and in this region as well, has been kind of sexually selected. Kind of interesting. Some things that can damage your hair is heat. Um, 
if you curl your hair, straighten your hair, use uh, hair dryers as well, can damage your hair as far as heat goes. It will cause these strands from the outside layers to become very fragile. And this is what split ends technically looks like underneath a microscope, kind of interesting. Dye is going to cause flaking of those outer layers as well. So it's again, just damaging those outer layers, uh, which is called the cuticle, in case you wanna know. Uh, and basically it's just the breakdown of the keratin on the outside of the hair. So let's talk about glands. So exocrine glands, possibly you've heard of its counterpart, endocrine glands. Um, endocrine glands are going to be like your thymus, um, your adrenal glands, um, not technically your salivary glands, it's not technically a part of your endocrine system, um, but your tonsils are also included in your endocrine uh, system. Endocrine glands are going to produce hormones. Exocrine glands are going to produce some type of sweat, uh, which is usually mostly water, but it can include, can include fats as well as salts and urea. So that is the big difference there. There are also two different systems entirely. So with sweat glands, you have two different types of sweat glands. You have merocrine, which can also be called eccrine. I know it's confusing. Blame anatomists. They call everything at least two different things. And then you have apocrine glands, and we'll talk about the difference between those two. Next, you have sebaceous glands. Remember, that is the gland that is going to surround uh, the hair follicle. Ceruminous glands, you'll find those in the ear. And mammary glands, it's going to be located in the breast. Also, females are the only ones who are going to have mammary glands. If you are a male, you will not develop mammary glands unless there are certain hormones that could be producing uh, breast tissue, but typically males will not produce mammary glands. So let's talk about these sweat glands. So as I said, you have the merocrine glands. Remember, they can also be called eccrine. Uh, they are simple tubular glands that uh, serve the function of thermoregulation. So going over here, we have our merocrine gland, which is going to release up to a pore. So it's going straight to the surface of the skin. And this is going to be sweat that you produce when you're hot. Um, and usually it's not going to smell. Apocrine glands, which is going to be this little guy right next to our hair, is going to release into the shaft. Well, technically into the uh, root, but it's really close to the surface, so it's almost the shaft of the hair. It's going to produce uh, sweat containing fatty acids uh, it is found in the axillary and inguinal regions. And if you remember from our anatomy terminology, that's going to be your armpits and your groin. Typically, this sweat is a response to stress and it can cause body odor. So that unpleasant uh, smell that you can get from your armpits or your groin. Um, but this is not your fault and you can take this to the bank if you want to. Uh, so if someone calls you out on your body odor, you can just blame it on your bacteria. So we naturally have bacteria covering our whole body, uh, in our hair, in our skin, uh, even inside of us, in our GI tract, in various other places. Uh, but what this bacteria does in those specific spots is it loves to eat those fatty acids. So the smell that is body odor in your pits and your groin is actually the excretions of that bacteria. Kind of gross, I know, uh, but that's just what it is. 
So moving on to our sebaceous glands. So they are going to produce uh, this lovely secretion, sebum, which is just oil. Um, it's going to contain broken down cell fragments as well. And this is kind of interesting. So lanolin is going to be found in most skin creams. This is technically sheep sebum, um, but it is very important to use moisturizers on your skin. Uh, if you do not use moisturizers on your skin, as well as, um, uh, wow, blinking, sunscreen, sunscreen, uh, that is going to cause your skin to become damaged more easily and also more quickly as you get older. Um, so remember that these sebaceous glands are going to be surrounding the hair follicle as opposed to the apocrine gland, which is going to just release up into the follicle up here, very close to the shaft, but still technically below the surface, so it is the root. Next up is ceruminous glands. As I said, these are going to be located in your ear. Uh, this is going to be found in the external ear canal. So that is going to be this structure right here, and we can actually see the cerumen uh, being produced there, and that's just earwax. Cerumen is just another uh, word for earwax. Um, so it is a secretion that combines with sebum, so oil, to produce earwax. The purpose of this is to keep the eardrum, or the tympanic membrane, uh, nice and flexible. It's going to also cause your ear canal, as well as the tympanic membrane, to be waterproof. It is also going to serve the purpose of repelling parasites. One of the most horrifying stories I have to tell you as far as the purpose of this to kind of explain it. So I was babysitting this young girl. Uh, she was about eight years old um, one evening while her parents were out on a date. And she just starts screaming after I put her to bed just out of nowhere. She just starts screaming. And I call the parents and I'm like, I cannot figure out what's wrong, but she cannot stop screaming and she's holding her ear. Um, I couldn't figure out what's wrong. We take her to the hospital and they found an ant had crawled into her ear and gotten stuck in her earwax and it was biting her eardrum. So thankfully we were able to get the bug out, but um, I think about that, 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 that parasite that, or not parasite, but that bug got stuck in her ear. Um, and that just served the purpose of, of kind of white earwax is there. Kind of weird. Sorry to horrify you. And last but not least, as far as glands go, uh, we have the breast and mammary glands. So do keep in mind that breast for females is a secondary sexual characteristic. Um, and it is a modified apocrine sweat gland, which is kind of cool to think about. Uh, so the uh, mammary glands are just modified sweat glands. Um, the glandular tissue will develop during lactation and pregnancy. So this is kind of an interesting concept to think about. And we will talk about this more when we talk about the reproductive system. But females, you cannot lactate unless you have pregnancy hormones uh, in your body. So this is going to include various hormones, kind of a cocktail of hormones uh, that you will develop as a fetus develops in the womb. So unless you're pregnant, have been pregnant, um, currently pregnant, you are not going to be able to lactate. Kind of interesting, because you wouldn't develop those those glandular tissue until you are in that state. So nails, let's talk about those. These are derivatives of the uh, stratum corneum, so that outer layer of the epidermis. They are densely packed cells with a uh, hard keratin, so that protein again. Um, what's interesting is they are flattened forms of claws and through evolution we have developed them as they are. What's interesting and kind of cool to, to look at if you go to the zoo or even just want to look up pictures or anything is that other higher primates have fingernails like we do. They don't have claws like a cat or anything like that. They have fingernails almost identical to ours. 
Their purpose is to help with grasping, uh, is an indicator of health, and allow for sensitive fingertips. If you don't believe me that they help with those types of things, try uh, peeling something back without having any fingernails. It's very hard to do. New cells get added into the nail matrix from the back. So much like uh, your epidermis is sort of like a push pop, so are your nails. And you can notice that if you paint your nails or have some type of damage done to your nail, um, my dad and my boyfriend both have a tendency to get uh, uh, a nice little blackened portion of their nail using hammers and various other instruments. Um, so they'll get this little like bruise underneath their nail that'll start moving forward slowly as the nail grows out. Kind of gross and interesting. The nail body is going to be the visible part of the nail. The lunel or lunella is going to be the uh, part of the nail that is this lighter portion up here. Right there as well but it is where the dermal blood vessels are obscured uh, by this thickened stratum basal, which causes this pale crescent. Kind of interesting. The cuticle is going to be part of the stratum corneum of the nail covering your exposed nail. So this little this little guy right here and then the hypochondrion, hypochondrium. Uh, now this is not a hypochondriac, which is someone who believes that they are sick with anything and kind of impressionable into thinking that they could have any disease uh, hearing the symptoms. So but it is the hypochondrium, uh, which is just a thickened part of the stratum corneum, and it's going to be located right underneath here. So do know those parts of the nail. Moving on to sort of an interesting topic, and if you wanna look at your fingers while we talk about this, uh, go for it. Uh, but your fingerprints, so these are going to be dermal ridges that make up this uh, unique part of your finger. Uh, usually the uh, pads on the tips of your fingers as well as on your toes as well. Um, they are all unique, even between twins. Twins have different fingerprints. The things that cause um, a difference in fingerprints is going to be just a hundred different things. In fact, the jury is still out as far as what really causes that pattern. But sometimes it's amniotic pressure. Um, it can be the position of the baby for some reason. Um, just your fingerprints develop in the womb and various things cause a, a difference in that pattern. What's interesting though is that each fingerprint on each finger is different. So that's why if uh, a criminal or someone who's getting arrested or something uh, has to do their prints, they have to do each finger. So you can't just do your thumb and then run it into the program or whatever and know who it was if it wasn't a thumbprint that was left at a scene of a crime. Kind of cool. All right, let's talk about bacteria. As I said, your body is covered in bacteria at all given points in time, so that's kind of gross and exciting. Um, but you have three bacteria that I do want you to know. You have Propenobacterium acnes. This is going to be the bacteria that primarily causes acne, so pimples, um, it is going to really uh, thrive in oily habitats. So if your face is usually really quite oily, um, then there's a good chance you probably have more uh, bacteria growing there. Interesting enough, um, again, when we talk about the reproductive system, I'll bring this up again, but the time of month so when a girl gets her uh, period, uh, she is going to produce a little bit more oil in her skin, and this is what causes more pimples during a period. Staphylococcus epidermidis uh, is usually harmless, but it is the leading cause of hospital-acquired blood infections. Staphylococcus aureus 
Again, also normally harmless. If you can't tell, most of the bacteria on your skin is going to be fine unless given uh, the opportunity to be kind of a bad bacteria. But Staphylococcus aureus um, can cause boils, folliculitis, impetigo, and cellulitis. And I believe I have um, a few of these examples over here. I believe this one and this one are uh, folliculitis and impetigo, I believe. But then Staphylococcus epidermidis can cause this, which is MRSA, which is a very uh, rough and also um, antibacterial resistant bacterial infection. Not good. So talking about a few skin issues going from uh, bacteria, talking a little bit more about acne. Acne is going to be um, where your pores get clogged. Um, so your pores are much like hair follicles. Um, and you're going to have within those clogged pores dead skin and oil. So we've all done it, uh, no shame, but if you popped a pimple and you see that white oozy gunk come out, that is just dead skin and oil. So again, the way your epidermis works is you're going to have like that push pop effect, right? Well, if your pore is clogged, then that skin has nowhere to go. So it's going to stay in that clogged up pore and kind of cause that raised situation as well as that white gunk to, to build up within the, the pimple itself. Again, you have those bacteria on the skin, which is also going to be hanging out within that pimple. Um, cystic acne is actually entirely different than just normal acne. Cystic acne is going to be caused from hormones, uh, specifically androgen, which is going to be a male-based uh, hormone. Uh, so that can include testosterone, um, but androgen is sort of a broad term for male hormones. But cystic acne has little to nothing to do with the hygiene of your skin. It's something that those individuals can't control. Usually they'll take uh, medications such as, I believe, Accutane. Accutane is actually a very not good medication. I'd highly suggest not using it at all costs. It has really bad side effects. In fact, most of the treatments for cystic acne have bad side effects. Treatments for normal acne, which potentially you could use for cystic acne, but for normal acne, I would suggest anything that has the ingredient benzoyl peroxide. This is going to kill bacteria as well as usually gently removing oil and dead skin. I would never ever suggest using things like, um, it was big for a while, but that St. Eve's or Ives, St. Ives uh, apricot scrub. Um, potentially it, it's too rough on your face. It's great for exfoliating like your arms and like the rest of your body, your legs, especially your back, but it's a little bit too rough to do it on your skin, on your face. So use something a little bit more uh, gentle for your face as well as treatment of uh, benzoyl peroxide if you have some acne. Dandruff which is going to be those little flaky cells that you usually get up on the top of your head. Uh, this is just going to be either dry skin, excess sebum. Sometimes it can be caused by shampooing too much, uh, as well as eczema, which is going to be just an excess of uh, the stratum corneum. So it just keeps those layers of cells just keep pushing up too much too quickly, uh, which is going to cause something that looks like dry skin. Next up, we're gonna talk about scars. Um, what's interesting about scars is it's when the dermis is damaged and potentially lower. Um, so if it's below the epidermis and it's been damaged, chances are you're gonna develop a scar. This is where collagen is formed in order to close that structure or that wound now there are two kind of types of scars that you can get. You can get a raised scar, which means that too much collagen was produced and it causes that little raised portion. 
uh, or sunken in scars, which means that underlying structures like fat or muscle have been damaged or lost. I like to think of sunken scars as being kind of like um, those really, really deep wounds, uh, such as like a shark bite. Now, that's not like bite off your leg shark bite, but like where it's like the upper thigh uh, got really bit into kind of thing, but they could keep their leg. But that really kind of sunken in scar. Sometimes there's there's, of course, examples of less extreme sunken in scars, but that's the one I think of all the time. Uh, something kind of interesting uh, as far as scars go, uh, scurvy, which is going to be a deficiency in vitamin C, something common amongst um, people who were out on sea, uh, so pirates and the, and the like. Uh, but what a side effect of scurvy was was that old scars could break open. And the reason was, there's actually two, is that the rate of collagen degradation is greater in an old scar than it is in normal skin. And so with scurvy, uh, the collagen would get broken down. It's kind of interesting. The second reason is the rate of collagen synthesis is diminished throughout the body in uh, ascorbate deficiency. So that is just that vitamin C deficiency. It's kind of cool, kind of weird. Best way to treat scurvy is to eat a lime. Not lemons, limes. So on to skin tones. I really think that this is one of the most interesting topics that we can talk about when it comes to skin because there's so many different types of, of skin, so many skin types uh, and so many colors as well as hair colors and eye colors. We'll talk about eyes more when we talk about the special senses um, but just know that this also kind of goes hand in hand with that. So pheomelanin, pheomelanin, there we go, uh, is going to be the reds and yellows. Eumelanin is going to include browns and uh, dark browns, which is going to have the appearance of black. Um, so this is kind of what leads us into having those different skin tones is the presence or the absence of these types of melanin. So more eumelanin, the brown to dark brown, is going to give us a darker skin tone. Less eumelanin is going to give us a lighter skin tone, okay? So the big difference between skin tones is going to be a difference in size of those uh, melanin particles as well as the amount. So again, more and bigger melanin particles, you're going to have darker skin, less and smaller is going to produce lighter skin. And then just to kind of answer a question that I normally get during this lecture is why are there so many different skin tones? Wouldn't you think that, you know, there'd be one skin tone that just worked the best? In areas of the world, yes. So the closer you get to the equator, the darker skin tones get. The further from the equator, the lighter skin tones get. So during, you know, human expansion out of Africa, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about evolution, um, from that expansion, you had uh, early humans moving from closer to the equator out further. So closer to the equator and also starting out, uh, humans would have had much darker skin. This is because of the exposure to sun. So the closer you are to the equator, the more sun there is, um, or the intensity of the sun is, is greater. How about that? And what that means is that melanin, which is going to protect you from UV light, is necessary really, really necessary in order to keep you from developing skin cancers as well as to keep you cool. Um, it acts as a nice reflective surface uh, if the skin is darker. So it's going to be a lot more uh, useful to have more melanin and larger melanin particles as well as more eumelanin as you are closer to the equator. As you move further out, um, those those uh, early humans who expanded out of Africa and moved more north or more south then developed 
lighter skin tones because they didn't need all that eumelanin. They didn't need those larger particles. They didn't need as many particles of melanin. So those lighter skin tones developed. Easy enough, kind of cool. A couple things that can happen uh, with skin, kind of neat things, I think, uh, is albinism and vitiligo. Uh, so this is where you're going to have little to no melanin in the skin, hair, and this can also include the eyes. Again, you have melanin, which makes up the color of your iris. Uh, minor hazels, so I have a brown-green appearance to my eyes. If you have blue eyes, technically you're a mutation, which is kind of cool, uh, but that just means you don't have very much melanin in your iris. Okay, so same with the hair, same with the skin, same with the eyes. Uh, with albinism, people who have it, um, usually they're blind, close to blind, or can develop blindness. They will also be incredibly sensitive to sunlight for the exact reason I mentioned on the last slide. Uh, melanin is going to protect you from the sun. If you don't have any melanin in your skin, hair, and eyes, that means that the sun is going to damage you like that. So keep that in mind. When it comes to vitiligo, this isn't like being born with albinism. This develops later in life typically. So it is the death of melanocytes. Therefore, it's a loss of pigment uh, in the hair or skin. Honestly, I find this condition to be incredibly beautiful, especially on this model here. Um, I really, really like her. She's one of my favorite models to follow on Instagram. Regardless, uh, it's a very interesting condition. It's not usually as symmetrical as it is on this model here. Um, but it can occur in any skin type. So it's just more noticeable in darker skin uh, because it looks like those patches of lighter skin, but it can occur in uh, lighter skinned people as well. So a couple different um, types of abnormal skin colors. I do want you to know each one, chances are this is gonna be a matching question. Uh, is cyanosis is going to be blueness from low oxygen in the blood. This can occur in the lips and face if someone isn't breathing. Uh, erythema, arrhythmia, <laughs> words sometimes aren't easy to say, is redness from vasodilation. So what I want you to think of is blushing. Jaundice is going to be the yellowing uh, from excess bilirubin in the blood. Um, this can also be caused from a liver disease. <clears throat> Pallor is going to be paleness from lack of blood flow. So sometimes you can get really pale, maybe when you're sick. Do you know what albinism is? Um, this can also be called hypopigmentation but that is a genetic lack of melanin from birth, as opposed to vitiligo, which develops later. And then a hematoma is going to be um, purple, yellow, bluish. Just know that it is a bruise, and that is just going to be visibly clotted blood. So moving on to moles and freckles, there is a difference between the two. Moles are going to be a collection of melanocytes, so those melanin cells, uh, and normally moles are going to be raised. Freckles are basically the same thing, but normally they're flat. Both can be caused by exposure to the sun, um, but they can also be genetic. Um, so potentially, if your parents are prone to more freckles or moles, um, there's a good chance that their offspring or you uh, will also have that same disposition. Fair skin will freckle more than dark skin um, for the same reasons that we talked about in the last uh, few slides. Um, fair skin is more susceptible to damage from the sun and freckles are a response to that damage. So potentially those cute freckles you get across your nose when it's uh, summer or maybe on your shoulders, uh, that's just a response to damaging your skin. Not good. 
So let's talk about tanning. Uh, these are going to be melanins uh, that are uh, that serve the purpose to protect your skin from UV damage, um, just like your freckles. Um, but skin will produce more melanin to increase its protection to your skin as you are exposed to more light. This is what a tan is. So you're building up that color, that darker color, to protect yourself. But if the amount of melanin uh, cannot keep up to the amount of light that you're exposed to. So normally they'll, it'll try to match the amount of light that you're exposed to, but if that light increases, the melanin can't, it can't keep up with it, uh, that will cause a burn, um, which can also lead to peeling. So that upper layer ends up just sloughing off a little bit prematurely because it's too damaged underneath. So let's talk briefly about skin cancer. Um, usually it's due to UV damage. Um, so if you tan excessively, I'd highly suggest not. Um, it will cause problems later on in your life. Uh, it's almost guaranteed. Uh, but these are mutations of your skin cells. So just some things to look out for. And I do want you to know these. Um, you have the A, B, C, D, E's, uh, which you want to look for asymmetry, a border, consistent color, the diameter staying the same, or evolving. If any of these things change uh, progressively with a mole, then chances are you need to get that looked at by a doctor. For the record, anytime you go to a doctor, you can always say, can you check out this spot for me? And I'd highly suggest doing that. Having someone look at your back or the back of your neck, somewhere you can't see, is also very important. Catching these types of things early is your best defense, aside from not exposing yourself too much to the sun and wearing sunscreen, okay? And then there's some other signs, uh, a raised bump, a sore that doesn't heal, uh, a red patch, a pink growth or something that has this shiny pearl-like appearance, not to be confused with scars. If you have any of these symptoms, again, highly suggest going to a doctor to take a peek at that. And then last and certainly not least, let's talk about some tattoos. Uh, so what's interesting about tattoos, if you have one, uh, is that that is ink injected into the dermis. If it's just injected into the epidermis, it will be sloughed off, so you gotta get it deep. Uh, there's a few different reasons why ink will stay in the epidermis the way that it does, but it does move around and shift as you get older. Um, but it could be that white blood cells uh, try to eradicate uh, the ink but the particles are too big. Um, there's a few other reasons it can have to do with uh, scarring. Uh, so you develop a scar since you are technically damaging the dermis and injecting ink into the dermis where it is going to be, you know, producing collagen and, and kind of uh, trying to heal itself, but that ink is there instead. So kind of interesting stuff. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, make sure to uh, take notes in some capacity and have a good rest of your day.